technical writing to engineers. Let me give you a little background about me. I've been in technical communication for over 36 years. And during that time, I've worked on many documents in several industries. And usually these documents involve working with engineers, either as subject matter experts, editors, or even authors. I recently concluded a 13 year position at Baker Hughes, which is an oil field services company, where I was the manager of technical documentation. Now, the most important thing that you want to know, what is in this for you? I'm going to provide practical information that I learned from preparing and leading technical writing training sessions to engineers. While I give my presentation, I would encourage you to consider this information and try to identify the components that you can use if and when you teach technical writing to engineers. But before I go on, I got to establish a definition. Most of the people who attended my training sessions were degreed professional engineers in various fields. However, Many other attendees were not degreed professional engineers, but they had advanced science and technical degrees. For our discussion today, though, I'm going to call all of these individuals engineers. Now, the origin of the information that I'm giving you today started with a request. About seven years ago, my manager at Baker Hughes sauntered into my cubicle and asked if I would be willing to lead technical writing training sessions to company engineers who were located in several Persian Gulf offices. And you can see them there on the illustration. Now, at this point in time, I had previously led a few short online training sessions to a small number of company engineers, most of whom were in Houston. However, the scope of this effort was significantly different and required me to reconsider the training content. Now, the main reason for the interest and the corporate interest in this was a corporate directive to have the engineers produce more abstracts and technical papers for oil and gas conferences. Now, let me explain how that works. Basically, an engineer would write a, an abstract, which is a summary of how a tool or a service solved a problem or overcame a challenge. The engineer would then send that abstract to an oil and gas conference. There are dozens and dozens of them. Here are just a few shown here. The oil and gas conference review committee would look at the abstract and try to ascertain whether it would be a good technical paper. If the decision was yes, then the Oil and Gas Conference Technical Program Committee would contact the author and tell the author, go ahead, produce your technical paper. The author then would produce the technical paper and submit it to the Oil and Gas Conference for publication in the conference proceedings. Now, with all that in mind, I then continued by producing the technical writing training sessions for the folks in the Persian Gulf region. I traveled to the Persian Gulf and visited each of the offices in turn. After about two weeks, we concluded the training. Over the next six years, I also led additional training sessions to many more company engineers who were located in the US and other international offices. I provided most of these training sessions as instructor-led training, ILT, where I would be present in the class as in everybody else. However, I also taught several classes in virtual training using Skype for Business. Uh, basically, we call them webinars. In just over six years then, I told, taught, excuse me, I led or taught a total of 54 training sessions. Now for each of these training sessions, I distributed or sent feedback forms on which the engineers wrote their evaluations and suggestions. At the conclusion of each session, I collected the forms and analyzed the information carefully. From this analysis 
and my session experiences, I then identified what I call 10 lessons learned, things that helped me provide effective training to the engineers. Now, at this point in time, I want to clarify a couple of things. These lessons learned are not only for abstracts and technical papers. These lessons learned are not only for engineers in the oil and gas industry. I feel that these lessons learned are applicable for technical writing training sessions, dealing with many documents and engineers who work in several industries. I'm going to provide the information and discuss these lessons learned as they relate to certain sessions. First, there are several lessons that apply to activities that occur before the session starts. Several more lessons learned apply during the session. And of course, at the end of the session, I discovered one more lesson learned. I'm going to start with the lesson learned that apply to the time before the session. In other words, the preparation and planning stage. Here's the first lesson. Now, it's a basic activity that many technical writers should be aware of and practice to analyze the audience. However, mine was a little different. My analysis was a two-part process. First, I wanted to determine and ascertain for certain basic characteristics of the audience. To do this, I had some experience with engineers throughout my career and had a fairly good idea of some of their characteristics, but I wanted to follow up with interviews and more information. So I interviewed several engineers at Baker Hughes and researched information on them, on engineers and what their characteristics are in various internet sites. In my analysis, I found some enlightening and sometimes humorous characteristics. For example, the next slide I'm going to show you is a graphic that an engineer produced and placed on his blog. It is his assessment of the basic characteristics of an engineer. I was particularly amused by the uh, can't spell idea. Now, in all seriousness, my research discovered many other basic characteristics of engineers. We'll start with this one. Many engineers, I discovered, are very detail-oriented individuals. They will, if necessary, perform detailed activities to fulfill their projects, to succeed at their tasks. Now, this translates in the technical writing training session to the, effect, to the effect that the engineers would want to know details about how to write their documents. I discovered that most engineers are very logical people. They want to perform activities that make sense. As a result, the engineers would want logical instructions to help them in writing their documents, instructions and information that make sense. Engineers, by and large, are very focused individuals. Concentrating on a task is usually easy for them for a certain amount of time. I'll discuss that later in, a, in more detail. Consequently, in a training session, the engineers would want to obtain information quickly. Don't drag it out. It should be no surprise that engineers are analytical and this illustration conveys this characteristic. To an optimist, the glass is half full. To the pessimist, the glass is half empty. To the engineer, there's too much glass for the amount of water. Engineers will look at a writing task, evaluate the information or instructions that you provide to help them, and determine how and if it will actually help them produce their documents. Engineers tend to be very organized individuals. I discovered that they respond well to training information that also is organized. Now, after I determined some of these common characteristics of engineers, I then moved to the next part of my two-part 
analysis. I wanted to find out exactly what they needed. I contacted several engineers and asked them about their knowledge or comfort level for writing abstracts and technical papers. I quickly discovered that many engineers were very concerned about writing these documents. Now, you might also detect apprehension for the document or document set that your engineers are producing. Many engineers told me they had never written an abstract or a technical paper, and they had little knowledge of what these documents should or should not contain. Consequently, the engineers were looking for tips, suggestions, and any information that would help them write these documents. Another thing that I discovered was this. Many engineers had not written a lengthy technical document since their college days. The emails, sure. Filling out reports, sure. Small technical pieces of information, yes. But a technical paper can range anywhere from 12 to 18 pages with figures, charts, and tables, and bibliography. Because of this unfamiliarity with writing a lengthy technical document, I knew that common writing mistakes would be a problem. So the engineers would need a refresher on grammar, punctuation, capitalization, etc. After I considered these engineers' characteristics and identified what they needed, I determined the second lesson learned. I determined that the best approach would be if I produce content that they needed, but it was designed with their characteristics in mind. To do this, I developed this agenda. Very simple, straightforward. I knew it would appeal to the engineer's basic characteristics of being logical and organized and based on their responses and feedback during the sessions and their feedback forms, the engineers truly appreciated this simple straightforward agenda. I would encourage you in making your training session agenda also to be direct, simple, and supply just what the engineers need. The next lesson learned dealt with the session materials. For the instructor-led training, I produced, printed all the materials, and I bound them in an organized manner, either by notebooks, ring binders, spiral bounding, whatever. Organize the material and bind it. And then I would place all the information on the tables before the engineers walked in the room. I received many favorable comments by the, from the engineers saying they really appreciated being able to walk into the room. Everything was there right in front of them. They pulled up the chair to the table and picked up the information and started looking at it right away. Now for virtual training, I used two different techniques. In one instance, I sent USB drives to the participants before the training session. The USB drives contained the electronic files for all the session materials. More successful, however, was to inform the individuals that I had placed all the session materials on a network drive that they could access, and I provided them how, the information on how to access it. The engineers reacted very favorably to these ready-made materials, I feel, because it appealed to their key characteristic of being organized. All right, that takes care of the first three lessons learned. Let's take a look now at some of the lessons learned during the typical training session. I found this to be very useful. In the instructor-led training sessions, typically there were between 15 and 20 engineers. Very few of the engineers knew any of the other engineers in the session. Very few of any, anybody there knew me. Basically, it was a room full of strangers. 
For the virtual training, it was even more significant where I would have close to 100 people present in various countries. Asking questions was useful to break the ice and to obtain some information about the engineer's ex expectations for the training. For virtual training, I used a chat feature or sometimes I experimented with audio responses. And in one instance, I used a poll. You might consider these techniques if you lead virtual training uh, sessions for your engineers. In, these, in this situation, I asked the engineers to respond to some questions. The first question I asked was this. To those people who indicated they had done this, I then asked a follow-up question. All right, tell me, was this task easy for you or was it difficult and why? From their answers, I obtained some valuable insight into how they felt about the task of writing these documents and the challenges they had. I then followed up with a next major question. To those who said they had done this, I then asked, all right, tell me, was the paper well written or did it contain issues and problems? We would discuss this for several minutes. And then when we would conclude the discussion, I would reassure them that the session, the training session would provide information they could use when writing their papers and abstracts. I would encourage you when you use this technique to create your questions around the document or document set that your engineers produce. During the session at the very beginning, I took the time and described the session materials. For the instructor-led training, I literally held up the documents, pulled them out of the ring binder or the folder and said, this is the abstract file. This is the PowerPoint information. This is the reference information. I explained everything what they were looking at. For the virtual training, I informed them what the files were where the files were located on the USB drive, what they looked like, and we would go over that briefly. This did the same thing for the files that were located in the network drive. Explain, take the time and explain the materials, what you're giving them. I discovered that this activity, although it took time, significantly decreased confusion when I asked the engineers to look for items during the session. Another benefit was it gave me the opportunity to explain to the engineers how I, they could use the materials when writing their documents. This activity, this lesson learned succeeded, I believe, because it appealed to the engineer's characteristics of being organized and detail oriented. Lesson number six was also very valuable. I used various teaching methods to maintain the engineer's interest and to ensure they understood the information. This dealt with the engineer's characteristic of being focused. One particular technique I used, I grouped the individuals into teams of two or three. This particular photo, by the way, was taken in Muscat, Oman. I provided the engineers, each team, with an exercise, basically in their pouch or in their folder or on the files that they had on their USB drive, I instructed them to look at the abstract that had no title. An abstract is a very important document when you submit it to the oil and gas conference. The title is the first thing that anybody reads. And so this abstract, which had no title, provided them the opportunity to generate this type of thing. So I'd give them some time to do this as a team and then we'd go around the room or on the virtual training, I'd ask them to respond and tell me what title or that they came up with for that particular document. I then would discuss their titles and made some suggestions. This was very popular with the, with the engineers. Some of them did an excellent job at it. For virtual training, you might consider breakout rooms also for this type of activity. Another technique, training technique that I used with great success on occasion, I arranged for a Baker Hughes person to come and speak 
to the group, either in the ILT, the instructor led or the virtual training. The speaker was an experienced engineer who had written many documents and was usually a member of the, a conference technical program committee. The people at the committee who reviewed the abstracts and papers. They, this engineer would supply the attendees with valuable information and answer questions. The engineers in the classes truly appreciated the candid and informed tips, suggestions and cautions that the speaker provided. PowerPoints, another technique I used. In every session, I use PowerPoint presentations. Here I am, by the way, in Kuala Lumpur. I knew the engineers would readily accept the use of PowerPoints and would help them focus on the content. However, I quickly discovered that the engineer's characteristic of being focused had its limits. My experience indicated that the interest or attention level of most engineers dropped significantly after about 25 minutes. After about 25 minutes, many of the engineers would begin to doodle, draw on their notepads. Some of them would open up their laptops and start answering emails. Others had a glazed look over their eyes. Basically, after about 25 minutes, I was beginning to lose them. Consequently, I discovered this fact and began to limit my PowerPoint presentations to 25 minutes or less. I also used some other techniques on my slides to help the engineers absorb and retain the information. My PowerPoint slides contained many images. I used text sparingly, just like the slides you are seeing today. This approach helped me retain the engineer's attention and to convey the information more quickly. Another technique that I used on my slides was sequential information display. Let me explain that. I would display a, a, a slide that looked like this. The timeline below is a depiction of how oil and gas conferences will transmit a request or a call for abstracts, usually about six months before a due date. I would display this slide to the engineers, and then I would click my presentation tool, and this would display. Whereupon I would say, at a typical oil and gas conference, approximately 25% of the abstracts are submitted to it between six months and one week before the due date. I would then click my presentation tool again, and I would respond by saying at a typical oil and gas conference, about 25% of the abstracts submitted to it are submitted between one week and one day before the abstract due date. Now I think you know what's coming next. Click at a typical oil and gas conference, about 50% of the abstracts are submitted on the abstract due date. The point I was trying to make here is Avoid sending your abstract on the abstract due date like most people do. The chances of getting it accepted are significantly less. The reviewers are tired. They want to go home. They're doing this voluntarily. Submit your abstracts early. That was the intent for this uh, graphic. I discovered that this technique was very useful and the engineers appreciated, I think, because it appealed to their characteristics of being logical and detail oriented. In a typical session, I also used various exercises, but once again, I was aware over time of the need to limit the amount of time for each of these exercises. So I tried to limit the maximum amount of time to work on an exercise to about 20 minutes or so. For virtual training, we use breakout rooms and you might consider that technique also. This appeal to the engineers based on their feedback forms and comments because it concentrated on their characteristics of being focused and analytical. For one in-session exercise, I distributed sheets or I asked them to access 
the information off their USB drive or the appropriate file off the network. These sheets contain sentences with various common writing errors. As you see there, punctuation, wordiness, many, many errors. I instructed the engineers to look at them and correct the sentences. After they finished, I explained in detail what the correct answers were. This was very popular. I had requests from en several engineers to do even more things like this on subsequent training sessions. I believe this appealed and succeeded so well because it appealed to the engineer's characteristics of being logical and analytical. Now, all this led to lesson learned number seven. In their packets of information or on the network drive or on their USB drive, I supplied them with an example of a well-written abstract and a well-written paper. I would then ask them to access this file or pull it out of their notebooks. And I would go over in detail why this was a well-written abstract, why this was a well-written paper, showing them examples of good writing, things that were avoided by the author to make the document superior. I believe that this appealed to the engineers because it dealt with their characteristics of being analytical and detail oriented. Now, for the next lesson learned, I wanted to see how much they retained from this lesson number seven in their packet of information or on the USB drive or network drive, I gave them an example of a poorly written abstract. I pointed it out. I told them this document contains many mistakes. I instructed them to look at the document and begin to mark it up as if you were an editor. Any mistakes, any problems, any things you see wrong, mark it up. I gave them appropriate amount of time to work on this. And when the time transpired, I asked the engineers to identify the errors that they found. This was very popular, especially when I told them that this particular abstract was written by a competing company. They tore into this document with great veracity. They also indicated on their feedback forms that this was very valuable to them. We would go over the mistakes that they detected, the errors, the problems, and I would encourage them to avoid them and show them how they could avoid these particular problems. This appealed to them because it dealt with their characteristics, once again, of being analytical and detail oriented. During the in-session exercises and at appropriate times during the sessions, lesson number nine came into play. I provided sincere compliments to them. I encouraged them to do the best they could in the exercises. I mentioned that questions that they were asking were very well thought out and very useful. I was stated appreciation for the efforts that they expended when they performed the exercises. At the conclusion of the training session, I expressed my appreciation for the time that they had committed. After all, many engineers had delayed work on their projects so they could attend the training session. Now this brings me to the final lesson learned. I designed a one page form that the engineers could fill out in less than three minutes. And here it is. As you see, the form had some check the box section at the top and some free form response areas at the bottom. For the instructor led training, I collected these forms, which were in their packets of information, and I collected them at the end of the session. For virtual training, I asked the engineers to fill them out and e either email them back to me or email them to the admin who was helping me with the organizational and the mechanics of these training sessions. In these feedback forms, I received many useful comments and sincere unsolicited compliments that I found to be very interesting and you know, very uplifting too. All right, this concludes my presentation. So let me make a few summarizations here. I suggest that for your efforts, 
do the best you can to recognize the engineer's common characteristics. You might find others that I did not. Make sure you know what they are. Spend the time, determine exactly what the engineers need for their document or document sets, whatever it is they're working on. And then provide them with what they need and use techniques that supply that information, but design all that for their characteristics. Incidentally, this training approach over time resulted in about a 20% increase in the number of abstracts that were sent to conferences. I would encourage you to consider these lessons when you lead technical writing training sessions to your engineers. And here they are in numerical order. And at this point in time, uh, the presentation is concluded. So we'll leave this list up and we can take some Q and A. Okay, we've got some questions for you from the chat. Okay. Um, where did the content for your exercises come from? <clears throat> Various places. Uh, I, uh, the internet contains an abundance of college, colleges and universities that have uh, tests and exams for students. Some of the information came from there. Uh, the SPE, the Society of Petroleum Engineers, also provided some information about typical problems that documents contained, and I generated some of the questions from that. And so I also found a couple of books in the bookstores, so a variety of places. I just grabbed whatever I could, siphoned it out, filtered it out, and decided which, which particular problems I wanted to, to convey. Okay, um, from Cindy, how did you get a poorly written abstract? I had connections with a guy who works. <laughs> I'm not telling you this, you didn't hear this. I had connections with a person who was on one of the technical program review committees for a conference. And I asked him to please send me some of the abstracts that they received that were rejected. And he supplied me with several. Uh, they were from for various companies and some of them were really bad. So I picked the one that was the, the best tech, best tool for the, the topic. So I performed a little skullduggery there to get it. Okay, if anyone wants to ask a question live and in person, you can take yourself off mute and subject Noel to your questions. Noel. Yes. Um, this is Madonna Lemon. Um, how do you, how did you deal with engineers that are very OCD and anal retentive? Now I think as tech writers, we're all kind of like that to some degree, but um, I, I spent uh, almost 20 years in the oil and gas industry and geotechs as a discipline are beyond verbose when it comes to writing papers. I mean, I'm talking tomes. Mm -hmm. So I tried to coach them over time of, you know, when they were doing their presentations of don't just read straight from your presentation, put some highlighted bulleted points and speak to each one. But in terms of writing a technical document, say like an engineering technical practice, how do you get them to get to the meat of it because some of them are very hyper focused and right. it's difficult to pull them off that the best technique i found was to show them examples like i showed you of a well-written abstract and a well-written paper and we would go through it and one of the points i would mention is see how organized this is see how the author of this document went from point a to point b you want with minimal uh, fluff uh, directly into the details of the information. Its flow logic is very, the flow of the document is very logical. Uh, and so follow this particular example. Then the technique of using a very poorly written document and sh having them look at it made them kind of, I would think, at least sensitive to some of the problems that they had. You mentioned a good point. Verbosity is something that <laughs> 
it plagues engineers that the it's one of the main plagues of the engineers that I found in the documents that I have edited when I was at Baker Hughes and I edited hundreds and hundreds of these documents. Verbosity was one of the problems. Rambling was another. Uh, it's in the short amount of time that I had them in my training session, I did determine that the best I could do was to show them something that was well written, explain why it was well written and then show them the, a poorly written document and let them tell me why it was poorly written. Yeah, it's an that, uphill battle, I'll tell you that. I also had, a, what I haven't talked about here is I've led presentation, technical writing for presentations. And uh, that's one of the things I emphasized was <laughs> don't stand up there and read the thing. Uh, people can read, you don't have to read it to them. And there are other problems with that, but that's a presentation or in a discussion. Right, right. Well, that makes sense because like their document titles um, and thankfully, at least the company that I, I came from had uh, very specific templates and, and guidelines, especially when in incorporating industry standards. Mm -hmm. um, the, their document titles, would, I'm not joking when I tell you three to four sentences long, it was a paragraph. And it's right. like, okay, this is a title, not, you know, part of the body of the document. Right, it was right. It's really hard to pull them off of that. I found uh, during my presentation, I would mention that I would have a segment that dealt with writing a title. And I found it very helpful to give them a numerical boundary. I would say, when you write your title, try to use 25 words or less. Being engineers, being the analytical and detailed people they are, at least it gave them a boundary that they could you know, probably try to stay within and it seemed to work it seemed to work that sounds excellent thank you for that mm -hmm. noel this is cindy yes so in number six you said use various teaching methods right um did you do that? You said one of the things you were appealing to was their sense of focus. Right. Did you find that that variety that it's like all of a sudden when you switched methods, they were like, oh, wait, now I really have to pay attention. Is that it kind helped. of what? It helped. Okay. Uh, variety helps. We would go from a paper based exercise, for example, to something else, perhaps the speaker, or I would go from the standard PowerPoint presentation to looking then move, looking at a document. So yeah, the bottom line is variety helps. It, it breaks up the monotony somewhat. It, it's, they get bored really easy <laughs> and they have a lot of things on their mind and they have a lot of job pressures. So I found that variety really helped out. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, this is Bobby. Yes. Um, how long were your training sessions? A full-blown training session was four hours. However, some of them uh, were, so, were somewhat shorter based on certain requirements, certain realities, but the full-blown one was about four hours. Okay, so it's a one-day... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. It's a one-day, one-shot. Yep. Yeah, that's all I could... Uh, that's all the time they could really commit. Yeah, I, I mean, that just stands in contrast to some of the corporate training I've done where, you know, I've gone in and they actually set it up as a course, uh -huh. which, you know, over a series of weeks, maybe six weeks, there'll be a two hour session at the end of the day. And what that did was to simply open opportunities to let them bring in some of their own work, um, mm -hmm. you know, use some other materials mm -hmm. other than what I provided um, mm -hmm. to make it even more relevant to them. So I just wondered how the time constraints really either got in the way of that or, you know, maybe ruled it out entirely. Yeah, well, there were certain realities. First of all, I discovered that most engineers did not want to sit in a, one, sit in a room or be online for more than four hours. Right. Secondly, <laughs> I also had difficulty reserving a room for, for more than three hours. Four hours was tops. So there was a practical reason there. But you're right, uh, there was no interest in 
me producing a weekly training session. They wanted to get the information quickly and then move on back to their projects. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's kind of what I thought. The helpful thing was I left them with a lot of it. What you don't see is the reference information that I left them. Uh, checklists on what to look for for documents. Uh, wordiness and words to avoid. Uh, ways to write sentences that are better. Uh, you know, there were basically things, either files on the USB drive or the network drives or uh, on the paper handouts, things that they could take with them that would help them if they chose to use them. And that, I think that helped out a lot too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Noel, didn't you give us a lot of those materials one time at a, a monthly meeting? Yes. Mm -hmm. Ah, so yep. they're here somewhere. Yeah, so dig through your vast resources. Yeah, yeah. Well, they're all in the garage, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's okay. They'll be more organized than ever before yeah. once they come back in the house. Yeah. I know just this one thing I wanted to mention, this international training was very interesting and very enlightening for me. I had never left the company, the country before. I had never gone outside the US. And here I was in the Persian Gulf for two weeks and then in Canada and then in Kuala Lumpur and then in Sela, Germany over the span of six years. But it was very edifying for me and it made me truly appreciate my country when I got back. And uh, hopefully, if you have never traveled internationally, you'll have the opportunity to do that. And you'll recognize that also when you come back. One other thing that's mentioned that in the feedback forms, one of the more common requests was to have more training sessions. <laughs> so it seems that a con and con you know, contradiction is to what we just mentioned, but a handful of people would typically in most of the sessions ask for more training. Now, whether they wanted a regularly weekly training, that's another issue, but they wanted and needed more training. They were desperate. They were desperate for more information. No, I've got a question. Um, the difference in teaching engineers over um, over uh, online Skype we uh, online webinars versus in person, did you have to adapt um, a lot of your um, uh, techniques? Yes. Take that into but, account. Yes, uh, I did a little homework on that before I did it, and one of the things I tell you, one of the things I learned is. For a virtual like what we're doing here, you should be you should seem more animated. You should seem your tech your voice should be more higher pitch. You should seem more active, more enthusiastic, because there's a significant downside to doing virtual training versus instructor led training. In instructor led training, I could see everybody in the room. I could see when they were began to lose them, or I could see when they were beginning to get enthusiastic and understanding something. So yes, I had to adjust by attitude, by presentation. I had to make sure that the slides themselves were much simpler because I could not see if a person in the classroom and a virtual training, I couldn't see if the person was you know, not comprehending what was going on. I had to presume that whatever I displayed, they were understanding. So yeah, it's, it is different. Uh, shorter presentations, much more clear, much more precise, much more animated. And then you have the dreadful dead, dead times. The dead time, yeah. Speaking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it, it happens, <laughs> it happens. But uh, I tell you this, 
I could tell you a lot of stories and I won't bore you with all the stories, but the bottom line is people are people are people and they have a problem. Whether they're in Sela, Germany, whether they're in uh, Kuala Lumpur, whether they're in Doha, Qatar, these engineers have a problem. And they really appreciated, they really appreciated somebody from the head office coming down and trying to help them out. And so I think that was one of the most uplifting and edifying things that I experienced from this activity. So Noel, did you say whether or not your students were there um, because it was compulsory or were they there voluntarily? Both, both. I'd say about 50% of them were there because their, their manager said, we got to have more abstracts and papers produced. You are volunteering to go, aren't you? <laughs> uh, but about half of them were there because their supervisors let them do whatever they want. Um, and in fact, the international students at the various countries, they were probably there mostly because they wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. It was a fundamental difference in, in culture, especially in Kuala Lumpur, where I was regarded almost as hair professor type of thing. The respect for me as a person was significantly different than in America. Yeah, I, I just raised that because I, I know a lot of the students I had in my class, the students, the engineers, Yep. They were there not because they wanted to be, right? Because they were told to attend. Yeah, so that yep. makes it a, a, a little bit more challenging to engage yep. them. But you're you're right. You're right. Brevity helps. Being straight to the point helps. Humor sometimes helps. I had some humorous things I discussed with them, uh, but you've got to. I mean, sooner or later, they're just going to have to buckle down and listen to what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Get the admin to offer food and they will come like vultures to a feast. It, it, it helped. It really did. It really did. Uh, we've had, in fact, <laughs> uh, a lot of them came primarily, I wouldn't say a lot of them came. Some of them I know came primarily for the food. <laughs> we had, we'd have snacks and fruit and in the morning we'd have donuts and coffee and et cetera, et cetera. And that, it really helped. It does. I've spent a lot of years as an admin and I had a manager complain about me providing food. And I said, you can't ask these guys and gals to sacrifice valuable work time and, and not feed them. Not right. for the morning and not in the afternoon. Right, I they agree. Food, they'll show up. Uh, an interesting thing that happened to me in the Kuala Lumpur training, I taught several classes there and they, one of them occurred in the morning and started at around nine. And we took a break after about two hours and I said, okay, uh, 50, take a 15 minute break and we'll all convene back here in the classroom. 15 minutes came, 20 minutes came, nobody came back to the class. And I was wondering what in the world's going on? So I walked down the hallway to their cafeteria area and found out they were all eating, celebrating some kind of festival or something with homemade dishes and of various type of, oh yeah, we forgot to tell you, this is a such and such holiday and we're gonna have here. Would you like to join us? Okay, so you gotta be adaptable. So I enjoyed some of the uh, native food of the area. And then after we finished that, then we went back to the classroom and, and finished it off. But uh, yeah, food, food helps, food helps a great deal. I'm afraid we've come to the end of um, Noel's uh, presentation time. Um, as Noel uh, requested, you know, in his presentation, ask for feedback. So I will be emailing you a link to a evaluation form for the mini conference. Um, and you can fill that out um, after the mini conference um, and let us know what you think, what you want improved, and we'll take that into account and incorporate it in. Very good. Thank you.